most of the hour and a half that we have with you, we'll be talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his life and his legacy, etc., etc. If you want to ask a question, if you want to join in the conversation, you can of course call us at any time during our program. The telephone line opens from the beginning. And of course, you can share with us your thoughts, you can challenge our speakers, our guests, you can pose questions if you like. would welcome you all to our program. Let's talk. We are going to be starting the conversation about the life of the Prophet of Allah I've been joined by two esteemed scholars, uh, Khidr Hussain, he's an Imam of uh, Masjid Aisha in Tottenham. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa Welcome to our program. This is the first time you've been to my program. Alhamdulillah. I'm very honored. Welcome to it. And we have also been joined by Dr. Muhammad Atiyah, who is an Imam, the Imam of South Woodford Masjid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. It's not the first time you've been here. You've been no. here before. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to both of you. So I'm going to start by uh, clarifying something from the beginning. Prophet Sallallahu was born in Rabiul Awwal, according to most historians, or all historians. What date people vary? A lot of people say 12th. And because of that spirit of 12th of Rabiul Awwal, 9, 10, 11, 12, all of these days are often celebrated by Muslims across the globe. Yesterday, I couldn't stop seeing all the Facebook, Twitter feeds constantly sending me pictures of the Mawlid here and Mawlud there, celebrations here and celebrations there. Sheikh Atiyah, uh, uh, question for you. Do you celebrate the birthday of the Prophet? Uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam wa rasulullah. What do you mean by celebrate? This defines, you have to define the meaning of celebration. If you mean uh, go and chill out, uh, dance, or have a gathering on food, then this is not the way I celebrate. If you mean uh, you do something special or uh, you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, at the occasion then I would say yes uh, because uh, the concept of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet Sallam is, is, is not uh, something that is innovation because the Prophet Sallam said in one of the hadith that we all know that when he was asked why do you fast on Mondays and Thursdays he said Monday is a day in which he was born so his way of celebrating the actual day of his birth was by being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing an extra act of worship that is not uh, 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 bound by that particular date. So in that way yet, I, celebrate, I may celebrate, I may give extra charity, I may do so and so, by not believing at the same time that there is a special act of worship to be done at that particular date, I'm just getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being more thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us the one who saved us from the hellfire in that particular day. If this is what you mean by celebrating, I do celebrate. But if you mean what other brothers do, like going and chanting some sheets and doing things, while in fact they don't do anything that the Sharia requires at that particular day, they don't follow the footsteps of the Prophet Sallam, then no, this is not the way to celebrate. Okay, well that's a, a, a clear enough answer on your part. What about you, Khidr Hussain? Do you celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa ala rasulillah. Absolutely. And uh, I celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu birthday every day in my life, just the way the Sahaba Radwanullahi alayhim celebrated. And I agree with Shaykh Atiyah, mashallah, well explained that the way we understand celebration is really following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam step by step, inch by inch in every aspect of our life, as opposed to just singling out one day for this extravagant, flamboyant uh, experience that many of our brothers and sisters have rather following the messenger system celebrating his life means that I uphold justice I stand for equality I stand for all of those important things that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam sacrificed his 63 years that he lived in the life of this world this is how we understand celebration this is how we should celebrate the birth the coming of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam I want to read you a note somebody wrote to me at the back of something that I wrote recently he wrote um, my Ustaz Ajmal Masroor, he said, I know you love uh, your love for Allah and His Messenger. There is no doubt and no questioning of that uh, to be had. All of what you have written is agreed upon with full agreement. But one small thing. Love, as you th know, is expressed in many ways. Do not denigrate, insult and abuse my expression of love on these days. We celebrate the Prophet every day, of course hundreds, thousands of times, with our actions of obedience, our tongue of salawat, and our returning through tawbah. 
we note our birthdays and our wedding anniversaries, etc., as a moment to express our emotion in a special way. This does not take away from the daily love we show our wives, children, etc. But they embellish it and create special memories. They can reinvigorate and remind. Such is Maulid, or Maulud, a joyous opportunity of outpouring across the world for 1400 years to thank Allah for giving us the gift, the best of His creation. Why deny human beings the opportunity to do that? In, if your point is wastage of food, misguided actions and pomposity, then call that out with the culture that you have experienced it. I have only experienced outpouring of sincere love and worship within the bounds of Sharia, particularly with my Moroccan, Sudanese and Pakistani brethren here and abroad. Go easy and be fair and be just. Your words hurt me because you are insulting me, my teachers and a 1400-year global tradition of law. Somebody, of course, took exception to more or less what you said, Sheikh Atiyah, is what I said. In other words, why shouldn't people come out and have an extravagant, a flamboyant celebration? Why should they not have extra food, sing and dance and have nasheeds? Why shouldn't they chant? Why not? What's wrong with it? You know, the brother, that the idea of celebrating the Prophet's birthday in this particular way, it has started early during the Fatimid, who ruled Egypt, and that was hundreds of years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So neither the Prophet, nor the Sahaba, nor the Tabi'un, nor the Tabi'ut Tabi'un did it in that particular way. To come and celebrate it within a particular way different from the Prophet ﷺ, the opinion I believe in, and I'm not uh, condemning others, but I'm um, expressing my own conviction. So, but I, you just said, yes. you said you do not like people celebrating it in ways that are, so for example, you talked about nasheed and sh uh, chanting, etc. No, if they celebrate nasheeds, which are within the bounds of the Sharia, while they are continuing to follow the Prophet Sallam, and do other stuff, then I wouldn't. So this say uh, a masjid, for example, is bringing some scholars to speak about the birth of the Prophet Sallam and someone who's g g giving some nasheeds who don't have anything wrong with them praising the Prophet Sallam. I don't see anything wrong with that. But what you know what I mean exactly. Some people they gather together and they start dancing, then to mixing men and women. They do the maulid with the, for the Prophet or for some other righteous people in that particular way, which is obviously going against the rules of the Sharia. Ah. So I will not celebrate or show my love to the Prophet Sallam by that which displeases him. So and how do you know it displeases him? Huh? He did. He didn't prohibit it, did he? No, he didn't prohibit it. So in muamalat, surely if he didn't prohibit it, it is allowed. This is no muamalat, brother. Tell me what is it? Yes. Uh, you understand quite well as a scholar that in Islam we have the aspects of the Sharia ibadat, and ibadah is the thing that you do in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking that this thing brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mu'amalat or the matters of the dunya, the things which you do as a routine of life for your daily needs. For these things, everything is halal. The second pattern, what you do for your daily needs, everything is halal unless you have a text that says this is haram. So this the, is exactly what people are saying. Default, just let me finish. Mm -hmm. The default is halal unless you have something that says it's haram. Yes? When it comes to acts of worship, acts of worship does not refer to the salah or fasting only. It is any act that you think will draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do it as a way of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be either approved by the Prophet sallam, or the companions after him or has a original basis in the Sharia. It doesn't have to be direct. For example, I celebrate the Prophet's birth by fasting uh, on that particular day. The Prophet didn't fast on the 12th of Rabi'l hour, but there is a basis of fasting, and there is a basis of the Prophet fasting on Mondays. So there is a basis, even though the Prophet did not fast on the 12th of Rabi'l hour. I got my own conviction is even the 12th of Rabi'l hour is not the most accurate date of the Prophet's birth, but this is a common date. So it's not something to make okay. any difference. Uh, let's, let's, so let's, the point is, this act is done by people who the majority of them think this is something that needs to be done to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why it's classified within the acts of worship for which you need a proof from the Prophet or a basis in the Sharia. I don't want to sh cut, cut you short, but I, I want people to stay with us. So just bear with me while I get you back and forth, back and forth. Sure um, asking you the same question. So people are simply asking, what's wrong with sitting together with families and friends, cooking extra meal, inviting more people, chanting and singing, even dancing 
at a rhythm. Um, what's wrong with that? But Ajmal, by the question we need to ask ourselves is, is this the way to portray the love of the Messenger sallallahu well, alayhi wa sallam? If we the go back to the Quran and the people, it doesn't matter if we bring forward uh, evidence with our aql, with our own logical reasoning. We, when we speak about the Sharia, our deen, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need naql, we need absolute concrete evidence when, we, when it comes to such actions that fall under uh, the umbrella of ibadah. Uh, if you say that, for example, mathal, an example, is this the way to showcase our love? Uh, we have to return back to the Quran. Any dispute, any uncertainty, Allah gives us the solution. Go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran specifically, well known verse. But look at the beginning. Allah brings a condition. If you claim to love Allah, this is the most important love, superior than the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You love Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa so much, but you violate the haq of Allah by doing uh, bid'ah. This is not love of Allah. Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ الْجُمْلَ الشَّرْتِيَ A conditional verse. The next part is very important. فَاتَّبِعُونِ You have to follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who were the best people to follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Talha, Zubair. Afdalu man masha'a ala al-ardi ba'd al-anbiya. They were the best of creation to place foot on this earth. They followed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inch by inch, step by step. Abu Bakr had his khilafah. Umar ibn al-Khattab had his khilafah. They all, they were ambassadors, statement. They were people who were in charge of the welfare of the ummah. The question we ask ourselves, did they not love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If they did, then on a state level, they should have had a celebration. The Messenger Sallallahu was asked, who do you love, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Aisha radiallahu anha. And then he was asked, and then the, who after her? Then he says, Abuha, her father, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. If we put all of our love, those of us who claim to love the Messenger Sallallahu on one side of the scale and the love of Abu Bakr, there is no example, no parable. But the question that we ask ourselves if we read history, if we open all of those texts, texts, we don't find anything from the life of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, the man who followed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi inch by inch. He gave everything but what for Rasul Sallallahu What you have done is you have actually taken a particular practice and you have chosen to call it part of ibadat. What if a people saying it's nothing to do with ibadat? It's my cultural expression. It's part of my celebration. And this is nothing to do with the need for an evidence. Why do I need to have evidence for culture? Surely, if it doesn't contradict an aspect of Islam, uh, there is no need for it. So by you and Sheikh Atiyah or any other suggesting that this is part of ibadat, you are reducing the argument. You are not allowing their argument to go any further. Why do you do that? Why not allow it to be part of Mu'amalat? It doesn't fall under the umbrella of Mu'amalat. What if they it say? Fall, how can it fall what under they the uh, it umbrella are... of Mu'amalat? Okay. Mu'amalat is that which you won't be questioned in regards to. When we say that a person brings something new into the religion, they actually think that I'm doing an act of worship that will bring me closer to Allah. So what if they say you're not doing an act of worship? What if they say, mm -hmm. I'm sitting together with my friends, I'm just going to drink, I'm going to uh, do halal, of course, eat good food, halal food. I'm going to sing halal nasheed. We are going to just have a great night with one another. And this is not an act of worship. This is just a celebration. So this, when we translate that into Arabic, we are saying al-ihtifal bi munasiba al-mawlid al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is when we bring the word celebration and we connect it to what? Al-idhafa. It's a connection to the Messenger sallallahu life. And now it was a mu'amalat if it was just ihtifal. But the moment we bring this ta'alluq with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are things that we do in the celebration. Some is good. We don't deny that. We don't discount that. There is a lot of khayr that the people do. But the problem is the ikhtilat, the mixing of all of the other things such as innovation which makes it problematic and for that so, so don't reason, throw the baby with the bathwater condemn the innovation understood absolutely. condemn the haram but why condemn their cultural celebration we are we, uh, we don't consider it to be a culture how okay. can it be so a then, culture? then then we if, are we're an impact we bring the man that we claim to follow and love into this particular celebration is not more oh, okay so, so, so th then we'll be in an impasse because those who support the idea that it is okay to celebrate they would say we're not calling it worship we're not making it a ritualistic worship we're just having fun and if you're going to reduce our fun to ibadat there is no argument this is an impasse let me ask my viewers what do you think of this what do you think of the celebration of the birthday of the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam from across the world from sudan to bangladesh from pakistan to egypt from uh, 
um, out of Mongolia to Cape Town. Muslims in various forms, shapes and sizes would be celebrating, uh, would have celebrated the birthday of the Prophet in their own ways. Gatherings, um, feasts, there would be walks and marches, procession. People would be singing, dancing, all sorts. Do you think that is something that we should be doing? Or do you agree with the two esteemed scholars that we have here? And that is, no, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do it himself. He only fasted in the month of, uh, on the Mondays. And he, there is a connection to his birthday perhaps, but not necessarily regular. Do you agree with that? Or do you think actually they're being too rigid? Do you think they're just being too literalist in their interpretation? I would love to hear from you, especially if you celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'd like, love to hear the alternative view. I'm playing the devil, devil's advocate here. Uh, I'm not saying I accept those views. I am trying to provoke and get a reaction from our guests. But I would also like you to join in, in our conversations and give us your view. What do you think about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu in the way we celebrate them on the day he was born? Okay, so let's come back to the conversations again. Was he born on the 12th of Rabiul Awal? Uh, before we go to that, uh, Azmul Bay, can I just clarify one thing? Uh, the word rigid means I'm quite harsh in my approach, but I, I, I'm strongly, that is not the case. I just want to clarify one thing here. You're, you're is, defending yourself. I, no, I, I, I honestly uh, think that there is extreme uh, or harsh approach from both sides. The people who celebrate it, I think that they do it with absolute conviction. They think there is so much hate in that. And this is the reason they do it. They don't do it because they want to do this and go to Jahannam. On the other side, the people who oppose it, they think, well, this is absolute clear innovation. And for that very reason, they advise those people. So there is two extremes. We want to maintain al-Islam al al deen wa adl wal insaf. Our religion is a religion of balance and having that fairness. And that's what they're Absolutely. thinking. This is the two extremes. And this is what shaitan wants. Innama yuridu shaitanu an Shaitan wants to divide us with all these things. On the day of Hisab, will Allah ask us, did you celebrate Mawlid or not? What was your opinion? This is not even in the questioning, but we are fighting over all of these things to the point that, look, what is our main concern as Muslims living in the UK? Our rights when it comes to equality equality, our responsibility, our social responsibility, political participation, all of those important aspects that we as Muslims need to show more ihtimam, concern in regards to. But we as Muslims, we are quarreling, fighting. We're not sitting on the same table well, uh, when it comes to these particular matters. Okay. So, so for I, that very reason, I think us, we need to explain to the people with balance, with love and with compassion. I, I still want to come back to the Inshallah. question that I raised, which is, I know Sheikh Atiya said it, it, you're not sure about the date itself, the 12th of Rabiul Awal. Do you think it was the 12th? Just uh, historically. Um, there is there is some evidence, uh, but for us to say it is to thubut, absolute cr concrete evidence, that is not the case. Imam Bayhaqi, he wrote a book called Dala'il an Nabuwa. In this book, there is a chapter, he called this chapter Babu Shahr Alladhi Wulida Fihin Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The chapter in when the Prophet Sallallahu was born. This is the chapter. The very only one narration he brought under this heading is he says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the, the uh, statement of Ibn Ishaq, the Muarikh, the historian, he says that it is his opinion that he was born on the 12th of Rabi Al Awwal. This is one uh, evidence. Imam Ibn Kathir mentions the same thing from Ibn Ishaq in Al Bidayah. So there is some evidence to say that and we don't throw that out of the window because these are reputable uh, dependent upon scholars who have that opinion on the other side. Just for, so for clarification, Jabir ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, they say, Wulid al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the 18th of Rabi al Awwal. So there is a difference of opinion. Imam ibn al Qayyim, he favors 9th of Rabi al Awwal. In another narration, he says, so there is a big difference of opinion. So if people that. are celebrating on the 12th, they may have missed it. That's the only worry I have. But I'm going to take a quick break. I don't want to leave you deflated and disappointed that you've missed the birthday if that's what you're focusing on. Because if the logic is celebrating his birthday, day on the day he was born and if it's not the 12th then you've missed it that's what i'm asking well let's come back and continue this conversation after this break so don't go too far away assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. We're talking about the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, it is not easy to talk about him without really getting you all, all emotional, all excited, all of us sitting on the edge thinking, Allahu Akbar, if it wasn't for the mercy of Allah and sending of this amazing Prophet, would we have been anywhere near where we are today? Would we have understood Islam unless this man had lived the entire living manifestation of the Quran in his life. We, manif we see that in his life. So that's why we love him, right? And yet we are stuck with his birthday. Amazing, isn't it? A man who lived 63 years, devoted 23 years of his life in his mission, we are stuck with his birthday. Should we or should we not celebrate his birthday? Really? Is that the only issue we have? And you know what is even more terrible, my brothers and sisters, is today, very today in Afghanistan, somebody blasted a bomb apparently, in a gathering where they were celebrating the birthday of the Prophet. Forty people died. More than sixty have in, been injured. Even if you disagree with people who are celebrating the birthday of the Prophet, you don't kill them. This is not the way of the Prophet of Allah So in the first part of our program, we try to establish certain facts. And I just want you to be very sure that we are not dismissing your view. If you want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ, convince yourself about the legitimacy and validity of what you're doing. If it is convincing and you've got evidence, then oh, we'll all join you. If you don't have any evidence, then we can't join you, I'm afraid. That's the bottom line. Let's go to the next part of the program. So Prophet of Allah ﷺ, actually, uh, 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 my son said to me yesterday, Daddy, are we celebrating the birthday of the Prophet? I said, yes, son, we are. He goes, how? I said, why? Why do you ask that? He goes to me, you have not done anything special. We've not got any special food. There is no family here. What? We're not celebrating the birthday of the Prophet So then I gave him a long lecture why we are. And he was fascinated. He was fascinated. But the most important fascination he had was, how is it possible that he became Al-Amin and Al-Sadiq before he became the Prophet? Mm -hmm. My son kept on asking me that question. He wanted to know. So I'm going to ask you this question. One of the most important characteristics of the Prophet, before he became the Prophet, was that he became a Lamina Sadiq in his community, Sadiq, um, yes. or whichever way you want to call it. He did. Start with yourself. How did he become that? And should we have more emphasis on this? Yes, brother, it is the character. And this character, the Prophet Sallam has been choosing, uh, as he said, an khiyarun min khiyarun min khiyarun min khiyarun. Allah has selected from the Kinana, the Quraysh, and from the Quraysh, He has selected Banu Talib. From Banu Talib, He has selected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And out of all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has selected the Prophets. And among the Prophets, which are numbered according to Prophet 124,000, Allah has selected the Messengers, which are numbered 315. And then out of the messengers, Allah selected the Ulul Azm, the five Ulul Azm in the Rusul. Out of the five Ulul Azm in the Rusul, Allah selected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he favored him in the entire humanity and the entire creation. So we're dealing with that man. He has been refined long before his birth even by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has never committed a sin even before he becomes a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the one whom Allah has praised his character. And his character has been just polished and more refined after the mission. But it was the best character at that time. And if someone whom you don't trust or whom you don't know his history comes to you with a completely new idea challenging your beliefs and your ways of action, then simply you'll dismiss him. Go and watch yourself first. So for someone to come with a message, even though he was challenged and he was taken through so many difficulties and hardships, despite he had that so fascinating character, they accused him of everything, but they never accused him of being unfair or unbalanced or a man who was a liar or was known for any bad character. They testified to him. And that was necessary because I won't believe in someone bringing me a new idea or a new religion or a new religion unless I believe 100 percent that this man is perfect. And this is how Allah was preparing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the core message the Prophet summarized it. So I was sent 
to perfectly good manners. And he was like that after he received the message and before he received the message. Okay. So a continuation. So don't, of don't, the don't, don't complete whole of his mission. We just, just focus on one thing. Yeah. Most Muslims today, I, I'm, I'm afraid, don't focus on the very essential characteristics of the Prophet. The non Muslim society around the Prophet who did not believe in one Allah. They had all sorts of terrible social ills that we even see in our society today. By and large, everyone agreed that he was Al-Amin Al-Saliq. When you and I walk the streets as Muslims, we get called terrorists. Something has gone wrong. What's gone wrong? The question we need to ask ourselves, Ajmal Bay, is uh, the characteristics and the qualities the beloved Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had that enabled him to win the hearts and the minds of the people people that were swimming in ignorance people that were swimming in immorality and indecency how is it that a man on his own and he had a society a large society against him how did he win the hearts and the minds of those people he must have had certain qualities and characteristics that enabled him to attain such a lofty status and win the hearts and the minds of the people and today we can confidently say do we have those qualities do we have those characteristics unfortunately we see those qualities and characteristics in our non-muslim friends and i'm not saying that muslims don't have them muslims these are our wealth that we, this wealth that we have lost today when it comes to equality what you're, what you're, what you're referring to is the collective quality of a people rather than the individual that's it. there are individual muslims who are mm. good but the collective overall quality of muslim today as seen by non-muslims is that these are terrorists extremists mm. they're suicide bombers they're not to be trusted mm. that's the collective identity of muslim mm. whereas the collective identity of non-muslim is that they're decent law-abiding mm. They, are, they have got justice and fairness and rule of law. What's gone wrong with the Muslims? What went wrong? I think the idea of uh, labeling all Muslims as extreme, this is something that is unacceptable, absolutely. Painting everyone with the same uh, paintbrush, that is not accepted, uh, absolutely, because the vast majority of the Muslims living in the West or across the globe are loving, caring, regardless of uh, what part of... Individually. In, in, but but collective yeah, identity of the Muslims. Is. But Muhammad Sallallahu was in a society where he was seen as such a person. That quality was given to him that he was a person of uh, extreme uh, ideology and so on and so forth. But how did he tackle that? He tackled that with love, compassion, and as uh, Sheikh Atiyah mentioned, with honesty, transparency. In a society where these things were uh, not apparent, they, people were oblivious to these qualities and characteristics. Rasul Sallam, he came, a man who could not read and write, a man who did not uh, speak like them, a man who was not as eloquent as them in the early days. But Muhammad Sallam, he had certain amazing qualities and characteristics that brought such a change amongst the people so, so, and society as a so whole. So that's Prophet I understand. But my question still stands. What's gone wrong with the Muslims of today? That we claim to be lo we love the Prophet Somebody wrote me a long email saying why the companions were amazing. They preserved his beard. They ran after his wudu. They took his saliva as their healing. I said they're thinking, Ya Allah, this is how they're reducing the Prophet mm. to the preservation of these um, outer manifestation. What's gone wrong with the Muslims? I'm asking you that question. This is one aspect of love, no doubt. But the other aspect is to stand up for what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood for. Uh, to showcase love and we have a big rally. We all wear a certain color to showcase our love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when it comes to us Muslims being oppressed, we are uh, subject to uh, violation of our own rights where we are not given equality so on and so forth all of these things are happening right in front of us uh, that we are experiencing these times of trial and tribulation when is the last time we as muslims actually said well let's come together regardless of our difference of opinion that you might be uh, from the delban the school of thought you might be from the Bailavi, you might be from jamaati you might be from ikhwani you might be from salafi let's put all this to aside we have a bigger concern at the moment as muslims because 20 30 years down the line this this will affect each one of us, the, 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 the challenges. When is the last time we sat down and said, let's put all this to a side? This is the main problem, that we are fighting and quarreling over these small things that today we find ourselves so divided, so uh, far away from one another. And this is where we have to come back to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, do you see this often that people are fighting over the beard of the Prophet, the turban of the Prophet, the cloak of the, of the Prophet, but hardly paying any attention to his character, hardly paying any attention to the fact that he was the trustworthy 
and truthful person in his society. Has the focus completely changed? And do you agree that for as long as we remain focused on the outer fights of the beard and the turban and the cloak, the inner uh, change will never happen? Do you agree with that? And do you think something has gone desperately wrong with the Muslim Ummah today? Do you think we have completely lost our way and no longer are we being trusted? And yet Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was trusted by his people even if they disagreed with his message. It's a big difference, isn't it? Difference between the message and the messenger. They loved the messenger. They did not doubt about his character. They may disagree with his message. Shaykh this is the point, isn't it? That they loved the man, but they, they may not have liked all of them, his message. That's, that's true. And yet we today see the opposite. Exactly. People don't like us, and of course they don't like the message either. Yes, obviously. It's, that's why the Prophet ﷺ kind of summarized the entire religion in the, the act of manners. And the greatest uh, praise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Muhammad sallam is the ayah that we all quote, Allah did not praise Muhammad sallam for praying so long at night or for doing. But let, let's put it like that, brother. You are Muslim or a non-Muslim, but you are my friend, you are my colleague, you live with me in the same community. Will you be actually influenced by how much I pray and how much I fast? Will this have an influence upon you? No. But you will be surely influenced by my character. Am I truthful or I, do, I cheat? Am I kind or am I rude with you? Do I help when the help is needed physically and emotionally and financially or not. So these is, are the manners of the Prophet And the manners that he commanded us to follow in order to be good Muslim. And the Prophet says in the hadith that we all know, I guarantee a house at the top of the Jannah, in the highest place for whom? For the one who has the best character, for the one who has a good character. And the Prophet ﷺ says, also, will be my company. Uh, among the most beloved of you to me and the closest to me in the Day of Judgment, who are those who have the best character. So if you love the Prophet, and if you truly want to be with the Prophet ﷺ in the Jannah, then have the character of Muhammad Let me tell you this short story. A man went to Umar ibn al-Khattab to give a kind of uh, tazkiyah or character reference for another person. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, see the intelligent, al-muhaddath Umar, he asked him, you want to give a character reference for this man? Yes. Have you lived with him before? He said, no. Have you traveled with him? He said, no. Are you his closest neighbor? He said, no. Did you marry from his family or did he marry from your family? He said, no. Have you traveled with him? He said, no. He said, you saw him praying for long times in the masjid then? He said, yes. He said, then, no, you don't know him. Bring someone who knows him. You know him only when you deal with him in the dirham and the dina. This is the transaction. Many Muslims nowadays, mashallah, big beard, short jubba. You go, you see them in the, angel, in the masjid. Mashallah, these are not human, these are angels. But they go out, they swear, they cheat, they deceive people. They, their houses, their wives suffer the most of them. It is but the why do the they Prophet do it, Shaykh Atiyah? The question I want to explore today, yeah. all of that, of course, but what is it that has got us to, and I'm going to get you to think about it. Let me get... Uh, 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 Sheikh uh, Khadir, uh, for a second. What do you think has gone wrong? Mm -hmm. It's easy to regurgitate the symptoms, but where have you got it wrong? Why is it that we are Muslims, claim to be Muslims, and yet we don't follow the Prophet's examples? Why? Perhaps it's our lack of understanding of the actual sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're picking and choosing certain sunnahs that are very uh, applicable for me, that are suitable for me. Uh, and when it comes to for me, convenient right. for me. Mm -hmm. And the, all of the sunnahs that I see that might go against my lifestyle, the way I live, the way uh, I, I, I d do my dealings, then I avoid all of those sunnahs. Wholeheartedly accepting the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every aspect of our life is actually the key uh, in showcasing our love for Muhammad so, so do you think, do you reckon that in the days we are we're little, when we are teaching our children about Islam, when we are parting the message of Islam, when we're developing their Iman, we're not doing the right thing because we are giving them emphasis on the 
outer manifestation rather than the inner. They go to the madrasas in the evening, they memorize the Quran like a parrot, mm. they learn how to pray like mm. a machine, they're told halal and haram and that's mm. it. But they're not really given the character lessons that they need to be given. Mm. Do you think that's what's gone Absolutely. wrong? Absolutely, and I think this is where we need to live the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not just uh, externally showcase the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As Shaykh Atiyah, he rightfully mentioned that we find many of our brothers in the masajid from the outlook, mashallah, they look like angels, that these people are very pious, very devout in terms of their relationship yeah, Sometimes with Allah. I wonder, how do you know what angels this, this look like? This is what it is, but if you, uh, and we deal with many cases when it comes to nikah especially, and we come to know that these practicing people, they go down this route, and this is how they're character and quality is is absolutely astonishing so sunnah we should live it and this is why from the uh, primary socialization of a child we need to explain to them the actual sunnah and the actual sunnah is uh, internally changing ourselves our manners our etiquettes our ethics our morals all those things muhammad sallam became innama bu'ithu li utammima makarim al akhlaq as uh, sheikh mentioned prophet sallam came to purify rectify bring that change when it came to people's manners their behavior their ethics so, so, so on and so, so forth so at and a this is the most important thing that we need to embed or inject within our children from a very young age so that's where we are failing so when they grow up they think the long jubba is the, the sunnah that they need to adopt, the beard they need to mm. adopt, the hat or the turban they need to adopt. And if they do that, mm. while they continue swearing, continue partying, mm. continue being abusive to their relatives, they're following the sunnah. Brother, mm. I'm a sunnah man. They, mm. I, I get that often. I'm a sunnah man. And that, their culture is rotten. Mm. I think uh, we can't discount the importance of the external sunnah, having a beard and other important sunnahs. But I think we have to get tartib al-awlawiyyah. We have to get our priorities right. Uh, there was a time, if we open the books of history, how Islam spread rapidly, like uh, wildfire. How was that possible? That these people who were involved in business, they went all the way to Bukhara, they went to Samarkand, they went to uh, Faris, they went to all of these places. They weren't wearing jubbas. They were people that dressed according to their culture. But one quality that they had that helped them win the minds of, uh, of the people, very honest, very transparent, very, uh, you, you could say, upright when it came to holding on to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how they won the hearts and the minds of the people. So you rightfully mentioned, I don't think Islam is restricted to the clothing and the external look. No doubt it is important. But what is more important is our external aspect of our deen. So, Sheikh Atiyah, do you think it's a good thing for you to have come today wearing these foreign clothes? Because uh, the listeners would think this is the Sunnah clothes the Sheikh is wearing. And is it part of the contribution we make towards the inculcation of the concept of Sunnah to our younger generation and the older, that this is where the Sunnah lies and this is important? Whereas, of course, it is not important and yet you have chosen to wear it. Uh, I may object, maybe some people will be surprised or saying that this is a Sunnah cloth. The Prophet Sallam wore the same cloth that Abu Jahl wore. No difference whatsoever. Are you sure about that? Yes, I'm sure about that. 100% sure? 100% sure. Now, I want, I want people to listen to this. <laughs> Shaykh Atiyah is saying Prophet Sallam wore the same clothes as Abu Jahl. Yes. I, I, I'm hearing you very clearly. Yes, Carry I'm on. saying it again. Clear. Abu Jahl wore a cap, Prophet Sallam wore a cap, so I agree with Shaykh So, <laughs> it is, it, the clothes of Prophet Sallam, one of the greatness of the Sharia is that in these matters of the daily life, it didn't restrict you to a specific type of dress or a specific type. So, if it is a tradition to wear a suit and a trouser and a nice, uh, nice shoes, uh, like bro brother uh, is wearing now, brother uh, Ajman, so on, Follow the culture of your people. Don't be different from them. But so we are. We are teaching our children from the day they're born mm -hmm. that Islam and the way Prophet was, we are limiting them to these outer manifestations. Hardly any madrasas and uh, you know, evening schools focus on character building. Yes, this is my thing. But uh, let me attribute the blame first to the family, not to the madrasa or the school. Okay. First, obviously, everybody has a share to play or a role to play, but children, how do children learn, brother? By copying. Yes. Okay. When I see my father and mother always fighting and swearing at each other, when I see my father not praying in the masjid, and then I go to the school and say, you have to pray five days in the masjid. Yeah? My father is not doing. Okay. When I see uh, my father cheating with his brother, sitting most of the time in front of the television or watching this and that and things, then obviously I'm going to, as a child, copy my father. Okay, and when I grow up, I will reach one of the two conclusions. This is my role model, and I should follow him, which is wrong. 
and this is my idea of Islam, or no, this is not a good man, I shouldn't follow him. Then I look for another role model, which would be football players, artists, etc. And so the role model from the beginning is wrong. And how come I convince a child of praying five times in the message when I'm not self, when I myself not praying? How I convince him to fast, to follow the way of the Sunnah of the Prophet when I'm not self, when I'm, I'm, I'm myself not following it? I, I'm not the hero of my child. I'm not the good example for my child. See, he will go and mix with other good and bad people and he will develop his own character. And then when I try to fix later on, when he is 12 or more, it's too late, sir. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sunnah should be inculcated in the child's psyche from the day they're born by our examples. That's what Sheikh Atiyah is saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think we as parents, we as uh, responsible individuals, we as guardians, we as imams, uh, we as community leaders need to display role model behavior to our children. Uh, in sociology, they, they call the early stage of a child's life the primary socialization. This is when a child is uh, dependent upon others. They're not self-sufficient and they learn through observation. Uh, and I often give this example uh, is that someone is looking for the father in the house uh, and the father's in the house and the home phone rings and the father says to the mother, he winks at her and he says, in other words, tell them I'm not at home. What are you teaching your child? that it is absolutely fine for you to lie. So they're learning from behavior. So then as they progress, as they develop, uh, you haven't nurtured them accordingly. So you have to be the person who will have to deal with the ramifications later on. And this is what we are facing. And this is why the Arabs, they would often say, Education at a small age is as if you are engraving on a stone. As well, if I take uh, a moment and reflect about our childhood when we went to the maktab, sometimes we get those flashbacks of the things that we learn. Why? Because it's within our long-term memory. So now we want to ensure that we give them the right tarbiya, we give them the right upbringing, especially expose them to the sunnah from a very early stage, inject them with the characteristic, the quality uh, of the Prophet ﷺ from a very early age, and this is when we will have uh, good ambassadors of the religion, good representatives of the uh, Muslim ummah living in this plural society. This is the issue. Prophet ﷺ became the most amazing person in the world, not because he had the loudest of voice and harshest of manners and strongest of arms, but he was able to win the hearts and minds of people. And yet we are not able to win the hearts and minds of people, and I'm very worried about that. So the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is being missed and misunderstood at the expense of what we call the peripher peripheral ones that have no real impact on our life or the lives of other people. Individually, if I like pumpkin, that's okay. Prophet ﷺ may have liked pumpkin. But does the society as a whole need to follow the sunnah of liking pumpkin? No. Prophet ﷺ loved honey. What if I'm allergic to honey? So I'm very worried about the way we are following the Prophet of Allah ﷺ in our society. I'm very worried in the way Prophet ﷺ has been reduced either from one extreme, which is celebration of his birthday and people are fighting over it, or the other extreme, ostentatious display, the outer display of what we call sunnah, leaving aside the inner changes that are needed to actually follow him. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about a bit more about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so don't go too far away. Assalamu mm -hmm. alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. We are, let's talking, of course, we're talking in our program about the life of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So far, I've obviously been talking about the controversial issues, identifying the issues that we have. Is the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in your house? That's the question I have for you. His uh, name may be 
framed in a nice, beautiful frame of the mant as a mantelpiece in the front of your room, house, etc. But is his sunnah in your life and in your house? I want you to look around your house. If Prophet of Allah walked into your house right now, would you recognize anything from his sunnah in your house? What am I actually talking about? Am I talking about your color, your dress, your fashion? What am I talking about? Let me take the call. Hello, salam alaikum, caller. Wa How are you? Alhamdulillah, brother. Very good. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Wasim. I'm from Liverpool. Welcome to our program, Wasim, all the way from Liverpool. What would you like to say? We got this topic on, you know, in of the Prophet Basically, I, 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 we used to do it ourselves, obviously, when I used to blindly follow. Then we started looking into it, and I'm not going to stay on too long because I just want to make a few key points. Go ahead. I'm, I'm noting and, them down as you're talking. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives a piece of hadaya and you try and find the answers, um, I, I, I delved into it and I found that there is no, there's no evidence regarding it. And unfortunately, nowadays, brothers blindly follow. Um, I done a bit of studying and looking into it. I found that Abdul bin Sawa, who was a Jew, who tried to corrupt uh, Islam and found Shiaism. And from there, many centuries after three, I think it was a quite few centuries. You're, you're muffling, uh, brother, you're muffling your uh, vo volume has completely gone down. So speak clearly into the phone. Is that better? Slightly better. Go for it. Okay. Basically, um, uh, regarding obviously, you know, um, me looking into it, that Abdul bin Saba was a Jew who found uh, Shiaism, and after a certain time, he invented this bidah uh, to corrupt Islam. Now, I found this, and I found, got down to the core of this. Unfortunately, a lot of brothers and sisters, they don't study this and go, go into this way. The Prophet says, Every bidah is a misguidance, every misguidance leads to hellfire. I studied this myself, and alhamdulillah, I found certain answers. Now, when we look into Islam, Islam has clear proofs. The Prophet ﷺ was the best of generation. After him was the Sahaba, Atbaim, Atbatabi. They all never celebrated this birthday. This proof, this 100% logic that they never. All of a sudden, brothers and sisters find this new birthday and they make it to uh, a gathering and all sorts of innovations that go on. I mean, in Pakistan, I, I, I see this happen quite a bit. And they think we're strange that we are found new Islam. Let me, let, me, let, let me share with you something funny. I lead Jum'ah in one of the masajids, and I yeah. do a rotation. And this masjid um, is quite well known for its affiliation to that kind of thinking, celebrations of the birthday of the Prophet. These are important things for them. So my uh, rotation is this Friday. Uh, so they called me up and they said, if you don't mind, can we cancel you this week? I said to them, why? So they told me that after Jum'ah, they will do lots of things that I will not like. And therefore, it is better for me not to be there. So they could do what they want to do without me feeling upset or offended. Uh, I, and I felt very respected by the fact that they gave me that honor. The fact that I disagree with them and that yet I have a platform to speak. But they also told me, brother, we feel you'll be offended by things that we do. So don't come. It's OK. You know, so there is a respect element, I believe, in our community that exists. However, we, what you're saying is respect cannot be a smoke screen for misguidance. Yeah. Also, as well, brother, we know that shirk is the biggest thing. After shirk is bidah. Yeah, and Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned this over and over again. Be careful of the newly invented matters. Uh, cling on to the Sunnah with your bowl of teeth. This is how it is. Yeah. But how we do you know. how do you define what is bid'ah and what is not? Because some people will classify everything as bid'ah and while others won't. I mean, this is becoming this becomes a very but, difficult discussion. I'll give you one example, brother. Go on. I've had people, we come with a silly, silly um, form of uh, interpretation. They go, well, mobile phone is a bit of, driving a car is a bit of. I've had people say this to me. Then I say, well, how could you say a bit is a, do a they, car driving? Do they speak in English to you? Sorry? Do they speak in English to you? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, I speak Punjabi, I speak Urdu, I speak yeah. no, Those are also bit of. I said I'm only spoken Arabic. Yeah, but at the end of the day, brother, any form, people say this to me, and I say, and I'll say to them, listen, basically, any form of act you do, a form of act of worship, yeah, that if I'm it, driving a car, how can we do that? Because it's not an act of worship. Okay, I think, I think I'm going to let you go. Thank you for that amazing point, but let's discuss this. People have 
misconstrued the concept of bid'ah, but others completely ignored all aspects of bid'ah. What do you say to that? First, we have to define what bid'ah is, yes, go for it, uh, which has been explained by the scholars. And I just want to mention the opinion of the Hanafi ulama when it comes to bid'ah. And when we use the term bid'ah, we're speaking about uh, ibadat, matters of our religion, that which has already been complete by the Messenger system. There is no need for any amendments, no, no need for any uh, adjustments. The ulama, they say, Kullu amalin laysa lahu aslun fi walam yakum alayhi dalilun min sunnah This is the definition of bid'ah. That every action, kullu amal, laysa lahu asl, it doesn't have, doesn't have any origin. وَلَمْ يَقُمْ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلٌ مِّنَ السُنَّةِ and doesn't have any concrete evidence from the Sunnah, meaning the stamp of approval by the Messenger of Islam. When it comes to matters of ibadah, this is known as bid'ah. Now, uh, Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he saw a man doing extra uh, ruku. He saw a man doing extra sujood. And then Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, who was uh, from amongst the Sayyid al-Tabi'in, many of the scholars, they referred to him as that. Uh, he said to him, don't do that. And the man says to him, أَيُعَذِّبُنِي اللَّهُ عَلَى الصَّلَةِ Will Allah جَلُّ وَعَلَى punish me for uh, doing an extra sajda aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu min rabbi wa huwa sajidun that you're in a state of prostration you're the closest to your lord hasan al-basri he says no walakin tu'adhibuka ala khilaf sunnah but you will be punished for going against the sunnah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that which has already been legislated has the stamp of approval there is no need for us to add or minus anything from that this religion has been made perfect for you imam ibn jarir at tabari he says rasulullah passed away perhaps 63 or days after this particular verse there is a difference of opinion meaning that was the for amongst the final verses to say that this religion is complete there is no need for us to bring so, something so, new so, so i understand that but people are confused about the concept of bid'ah because for example would you classify the celebration of the birth of the Prophet is a bid'ah, would you? I know uh, we're not going back to it, but the concept of bid'ah needs to be properly defined. Yes, I know you have given yours. As, uh, I'll stay away from this, the technical definitions. I'll put it simply for people, lay people to understand. Bid'ah, the word bid'ah in Arabic means something new. So when a child is born, we call him bid'ah. But this is a linguistic meaning. The technical meaning that pertains to the Sharia is that Anything that is brought into the religion, anything new that is brought into the religion and is believed to bring the person closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to be part of the religion. Mm. So I can't call the washing machine, the aeroplanes, or speak another language because these are all cultural matters, routine daily lives. So any new invention in this regard, in the worldly matters, is praised, is good. But any new thing in the religion, that's why the original rule that whatever is not of a religious nature is new and is new and is beneficial is praiseworthy. W wasn't the prophet? So that, okay, I mean, so I, I think we've understood. Let me finish that point first. Okay, go. So the second point is that whatever comes to religion, anything is haram, which means you're not allowed to do it unless you have a proof from the Sharia. So the back to the topic of the Maulid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those people who celebrate the Maulid, with full respect to them. Why do they do so? What is their... Because they love the Prophet. They love the Prophet. They want to so express their love Exactly. Openly. So there is a little religious motivation in this. And they think by doing so, they are pleasing the Prophet and they are pleasing Allah. So what else can you say about religiosity in this regard? So the motivation speaks about itself. I'm doing that to please Allah and to please the Prophet. So I'm considering this an act that is pleasing to Allah, which is the definition of any act of worship. So, as simple as that. So now let's translate that into following the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into day-to-day -day matters. So we talked about how people don't focus on character building. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had other very important priorities yes. in his mission. Give us one or two of those priorities that we have failed to follow in our day-to-day -to -day life today. Priorities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I believe in Allah and then follow. The straight path. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Istakhim, a straight path. Because there are so many paths, so many ways of showing love. But which one is, which one is the true one? Which one is the, is the proper one? So you will have a billion opinions. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there, to lift the ikhtilaf, to lift the difference of opinions. So I understand there are so many ways of expressing love. But which one would be the best? Isn't it the one that whom you loved it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one whom you loved, 
like the Sahaba did. So this is the best way. Follow it. Because when we leave the religion for minds, minds vary so much. What you see proper, I see improper. What you see good, I see bad. And the other way. So we will have infinite numbers of ways. So what to do? Just follow the proper way of the Prophet. So I meant to believe. Believe, have correct aqidah. And istakum, follow the way of Muhammad sallallahu as interpreted by the Salaf, the righteous predecessors of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When there is something muddy or something suspicious, keep away from it. The Prophet sallallahu says again the famous hadith: the halal is clear and the haram is clear, and there is a gray area in between. Like a shepherd who has his own flock grazing at the borders of a farm owned by a king. He did not go into the farm. But what will the sheep do at the end of the day? They will go into the farm against the shepherd's will. So Prophet said, this is a gray area. When you come close to it, even with the intention of not going into the haram, you will fall into it. So this, this, uh, uh, this uh, thing of celebrating the Prophet's birthday, I will classify, if I'm very simplistic or very lax, I classify it as one of the gray areas. So what is safer? Keep away from it. Otherwise, you might think... So, so, so huh? I think the issue still hasn't been uh, dealt with, the issue that I have highlighted, which is how have Muslims forgotten their priorities? So from the life of the Prophet Muhammad in his mission, one of them is given by Shaykh earlier on about character, the hadith that you both have quoted. What other priorities was the Prophet giving as part of his mission to the people. What was his priority? Ajmal, by, by default, all of us are ambassadors and representatives of the deen of Allah. The moment that we have said la ilaha illallah, we have automatically become representatives of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Us Muslims living in the West, uh, I want us to really think about our role in this society because it's not different from the role of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi in the society that he came uh, to. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, he came to a society where immorality, indecency was very widespread. Rasul sallallahu he changed that society with such quality qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with. The question we need to ask ourselves is, do we have those qualities living in this society? Because if we have those qualities, then we have truly understood the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam. And then we can celebrate his life every day within our uh, lives. Not just handpick one particular day and then we uh, celebrate or we showcase our love for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To say that, I don't discount the importance of uh, reading his life. We don't discount the importance of uh, his external sunnah, so on and so forth. Like yourself, uh, I'm sure in this particular month, you have spoken about the life of the Messenger Islam in a conference or in your khutub or, or, or the places that you go to. Rabi ul Awal is a month where the Prophet Islam, we all agree that he was born in this month and there is an agreement mujma alayhi amongst the scholars that he was born on Monday. In terms of the actual date, there is a difference of opinion. So why not use this month to speak about the life of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa But, but prioritize his mission. So if Prophet sallallahu was, if you were following the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you had some missions to accomplish, his mission was to bring people to Allah, transform them from depth of darkness to give them some light, light from Allah again. What was his important footsteps? What were the things that he would do, that we should do and prioritize in our life? Establish justice. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to say this. Why? Because we as Muslims, if we can uphold justice, equality, and speak for our religion and remain for, firm upon that, then that is actually showcasing the love of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The very thing Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did in his khilafah, Ahmad ibn al-Khattab, he did during his khilafah, Uthman ibn Affan did during his time, even though many of the Sahaba opposed him. But what Allah and his Rasul decided, Uthman ibn Affan, he was firm upon that. And that is a good example for us of upholding justice as Muslims wherever we may be, whether it's in the subcontinent, whether it's Africa, whether it's Europe, uh, speaking out against oppression, speaking out against the violation of Muslims. That is our role uh, you, you, as Muslims. You're referring to Saudi Arabia in particular, I'm assuming. Perhaps, perhaps, or any other current issues that we see, not only Saudi Arabia, in Palestine, in Syria, in Libya, uh, currently in Bangladesh, uh, in Pakistan, everywhere it's happening, oppression against Muslims, and this is a way of showcasing our love 
love and I could say confidently uh, it is actually from amongst the top things that we need to focus on is speaking out against injustice and standing for the deen of Allah this is actually a Muslim showcasing the love of Rasulullah so as far as you're concerned one of the most important priorities that Muslims should be depicting in their lives showcasing that they truly love the Pro Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that they should demonstrate justice in everything that they do absolutely now the problem I have is that Muslims don't have justice you come from Egypt you would not find justice in Egypt. So My parents come from Bangladesh. There is no justice in Bangladesh. In I fact, there is no question, justice in, in most Muslim countries today. It, it is done in the wrong way. It says, where is there justice? Anywhere in the Muslim world. Anywhere in the world, it actually. You might have find some countries. More justice in Britain than yeah, any no, Muslim country. Just let, me, mm. let me finish this. There are internal justice in Muslim countries. But in their foreign policy, are they just? No. But with us Muslims, it is even more heartbreaking because we neither have justice in our foreign policy, if we have any foreign policy, nor within ourselves. Okay? And look, Muslims are the most practicing, in terms of ritual acts of worship, community in the world. Pause, because somebody is inspired by your thoughts and calling. Let's talk to them first. Hello, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum as Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. How are you? I am, alhamdulillah, okay. I am fascinated by your discussion. Wonderful. You have, you have touched one point which I consider, I'm a senior citizen, I consider the vital point we need to discuss more, which is action speak louder than anything wow. else. Mm -hmm. So whatever talk we do is going to have very little impact on anyone unless we come to a common turn of speaking and understanding same thing but most of us. What I mean by do, <coughs> doing it is, is like if your son who is say about 10 years old yes. asks you about something about Islam and who has very little knowledge of Arabic language and you start reciting in front of him uh, Quranic ayat and you start without explaining what these ayat are and what are they for and what are the benefit for you and me and him all this in the common language which both of us will understand then at the end of the day we will just copy some people it's like wearing a an uniform and putting a tag on and saying I'm something special. That's what we are doing as a Muslim. And <clears throat> celebrating Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's birthday, what's happened was the time he was born, nobody knew he was going to become the best of all creation. And at that time, culturally, and the progress of the world was not as such that people were documenting everything documentarily. Rasulullah mm. himself has said we are not very literate people and we don't document our thing very closely. So what happens is what we're going to do is although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to learn and he has said in his glorious book, his own speech, the glorious Quran, what he said. He said in Surah number 47, which is named Muhammad, which is name of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we need to learn first before we do anything. Okay, thank you. And what we don't understand nowadays is what is the practice of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fantastic point. We do not understand the practice of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our words are far too much in comparison to our actions. I agree entirely. Fantastic call. Keep those calls coming. Let's talk to you and, of course, hear your views. And if you've got any questions to both of our esteemed scholars, you can ask them. Shahati, I disturbed you while you're talking. Please carry on, but briefly. We're running out yes, of time. So, Imam uh, Ibn says, Allah will support the Kafir nation if they are fair and just, and Allah will disgrace the Muslim nation if they are unfair and unjust. So, what we need, our first... You've just answered the question. Yes. You've just answered the question. The reason why Muslim nations today are disgraced is because there is no justice yes. in the Muslim nations. But more important than, obviously, justice is top importance, but equally important, if I can say the proper words, is solidifying the ranks of the Muslim now. We are the most practicing in terms of ritual acts of worship, but we are the most involved in, in bribery, in corruption. corruption, in violence against others and more against our own selves, in, 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 in lying, in cheating. So what is the, is this the character of Muhammad is the Is this the mannerism of the followers of Muhammad So first, stop fighting each other. Come to a table. No matter how big the differences you have, there is so many to unite us than 
uh, much more than what we have in difference. So rather than hey, it's haram or halal, you are kafir, you have bid'ah. Or, so we we have, we follow the same man. We read the same book. We pray the same five daily prayers. That's enough of a thing to bring us together. And if we cannot come together, then obviously we will not be able to go anywhere. To go anywhere. Abu Bakr he stopped everything when people started leaving the religion of Islam or refusing to pay zakah, solidified the ranks of the ummah, and then he paid attention to others. So, so, so your your priority your priority is justice. Your priority is to solidify the ranks of the Muslim Ummah. Yes, obviously. Oh, so when you say solidify, do you mean what does, what, in, in, a, in, in a simple layman's term, what does that really mean? Yeah, I mean, set aside the, the differences and the fighting, the physical fighting among us, and just agree on that man, Muhammad Sallam, and on that book, on the, that God, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and work on what combines us rather than what differentiates so, us. So the unity of Muslims. The unity of the Muslims. So justice Muslims. and unity are the two uh, important priorities. Yes. I'm going to only give you one more chance to give one more priority from yourselves and then we're done for, the for tonight. What's another priority that you would focus on from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I think as one family, as one community, uh, I have to go back to what Shaykh Atiyah says, unity is absolutely essential. He's already given essential. unity. Uh, well, do you have I another one? This, I I think the key to achieving the rest is upon unity. Okay. If we can all sit down on the same table and have a healthy, organic conversation, put aside all of the nafal and mustahab and focus on our fard and wajib, then this is the key to success. Because disagreement was always in place during um, generation. Fi kulli amsarin wa asarin in every town and every generation. But these differences of opinion shouldn't divide us because difference of opinion was and will be, uh, and that is the case. But, and this is why uh, Imam Sakhawi he says that the ikhtilaf of my ummah is rahmah. Because why? Because the more they debate, they discover things and they will find the truth. Okay. But the moment it becomes hatred, this is zahmah. This Thank is you. something that is unacceptable. Thank you. I think both of you have given the unity as a very important. So we celebrate uh, the life of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallam, every day by following his footsteps. We celebrate by focusing on his character and building our character. We celebrate his birthday by standing for justice and fairness, as you said earlier on. We celebrate his birthday every day by taking care of our neighbors, by by showing that we care and by sharing our food, by being charitable. We celebrate his birthday by being so charitable, like the Prophet of Allah was, giving away everything that we have because we care for everyone around us. We celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah by showing that people around us are safe from our tongue and our hands, so there is no violence and they're not abused. We celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah every day by valuing all lives everywhere in the world, by working to protect them, by preserving the lives and not taking them. We celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah every day by speaking the truth or remaining silent. If we can't speak the truth, stay quiet, as the Prophet said. We celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah by being good to our parents, an example that we set for the rest of the society. We take care of them because it is by serving our parents we can gain Jannah. We celebrate the birthday of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu by leading a balanced life like both of our shaykh have said, have said. We need to be balanced and in the middle. Always just and balanced and always just and moderate rather than extreme. Brothers and sisters, life of the Prophet Sallallahu cannot be followed by just celebrating his birthday. Life of the Prophet Sallallahu can only be followed only be celebrated if you follow his footsteps. May Allah give us the strength to be able to do that. And thank you for watching. Thank you to my both uh, guests, uh, Khidr Hussain and Mahmoud Atiyah, and to yourselves. Until next time, from me and my guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For more updates, subscribe and press the bell icon on YouTube app and never miss another update.